Welcome to Empower Humans. Welcome again to the Empower Humans podcast. This is episode 164, my friends. Today we're welcoming Rebecca Morrison. She's the author of a book called The Happiness Recipe, A Powerful Guide to Living What Matters Most. And boy, we touched on a lot of great stuff here. Um, Really great material about figuring ourselves out, untangling the uh, situations that we're in in our lives, decluttering whatever might happen. Because as we discussed here in the interview, you'll find out how that's just what happens in life. And if you go on Amazon, look up this book. Uh, She talks a little bit about that in the kind of synopsis of the book that's on there. And I would highly recommend go pick up that book, The Happiness Recipe, A Powerful Guide to Living What Matters. So before we jump into that, I want to first say, as some of you may have noticed, we've gone a little bit without having an episode. (laughs) And uh, so this is the first episode in a number of some weeks and just so you understand, nothing's wrong here with me. Nothing's, you know, I, I, I'm not on my deathbed or something. Uh, not that any of you care. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, I'm revamping some things. I'm building some things. And we're doing some important work as well. Um, hopefully, we'll get back into a steady flow with the podcast here um, moving forward. So um, I just want to express my love and appreciation uh, for your support, love, and patience with me. And also, I want to remind you, as always, you are absolutely priceless. Uh, what does that mean? Well, it means, as I've pointed out before, you're above the monetary systems and the nonsense, the material garbage of this world. Uh, you're worth far more than that. The riches are found in you, as I always say. And uh, along with that, you're never alone. So if you're feeling, you know, so many people are going through so many things and somehow we've been trained in our society at least especially in America, but I think globally, to put on a front to just always pretend everything's great at all times because, God forbid, people think ill of us because we're going through something. But uh, guess what? I've gone through things. I'm sure that a lot of you are and have been going through some things here and there, especially with all this COVID stuff and everything else. But please remember, you're never alone. You can reach out, info at empowerhumans.com, at empower101 on Instagram and on Twitter, and uh, reach out also to friends, family, neighbors, Uh, let's not forget that these people are around or not give them credit because in my experience, most people in the world are good. Most people want to help and lift each other. Um, So if you're in a position where you need some of that help, guidance, support, uh, please don't be shy. Don't be scared to reach out. Uh, any of those resources I just mentioned and more. And uh, our challenges real quick before we jump into the interview, study, start studying, keep studying. I've listened to a bunch of audiobooks lately and been reading a, a bunch of things as well. There's just something about doing that that tunes your mind and teaches you. And I've learned so many things. Plus, I've uh, listened to some audiobooks from some uh, just some really great stories of musicians. I just listened to Dave Grohl's audiobook that just came out. I think it's called The Storyteller. And he tells stories from childhood in Virginia, all the way to uh, joining the band Scream and the band Nirvana and starting the Foo Fighters and all these stories in between with Paul McCartney and all kinds of great... That's up my alley because I'm a drummer, for one, and also I just love music. And uh, these guys... I met Dave Grohl one time. I ran into him when I was in L.A. And uh, one of the coolest people around. And I, I used to play his music on the drums. But again, I digress. Whatever that is for you, and it's not just stuff like that. Like, I'm learning things. Uh, neuroscience and other things like that, just learning about us as people and myself uh, along the way. So I can't say enough about studying. Find a, a place for that uh, that fits for you. And that could be listening to an audiobook while you're commuting to and from work or to and from the grocery store or doing the dishes or whatever. That's why I love audiobooks. But also if you if you prefer to sit down and read a book, if you're on an, on an airplane or something, instead of staring out the window and drooling, you can pull, pick up a book or something too. Moving on, our second challenge is make great moments. We talk about the importance and how that works a little bit more in depth in this podcast interview, but making great moments really entails finding the things and the people that matter most in our lives and uh, showing that they matter, turning love into a verb. And uh, so making great moments, that can entail surprising somebody, that can entail all kinds of stuff, but find what that means for you and uh, express love as a verb. And uh, and you'll see in a lot of cases that can be reciprocated as well. Not that we need to be selfish, but it builds relationships by making great moments. And these are pillars in our lives, as I've said, that overshadow the nonsense and the mistakes and the other things that may have gone wrong uh, as we go through our, throughout our lives. And the last challenge, my friends, is let's keep doing this podcast together. I haven't always uh, been consistent. There have been a few gaps at, at times uh, with the podcast. And some of you have been sitting back waiting like, well, where's an episode? Um, so we're going to get more consistent on that as we as we build a lot of infrastructure moving forward with Empower Humans. Um, but let's keep doing this podcast together. I appreciate everyone sitting tight and, and sticking with us. 
and uh, come and join us today to, as we talk with the one and only Rebecca Morrison. So, and by the way, jump over to her website, untanglehappiness.com. And uh, without further ado, let's jump right in. Here we are with Becky Morrison. Let's go. We are uh, pleased and happy to welcome today Becky Morrison, who is a coach, author, speaker, and other titles, wife, mother. <laughs> All these other, we were just chatting for a minute. How are you doing today, Becky? I'm doing well today, Phil. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure to have you. I uh, We were talking about your book a little bit and stuff, but before we jump into all that, and by the way, the book is called The Happiness Recipe, A Powerful Guide to Living What Matters, and go look that up on Amazon while we uh, chat here, But um, or after we're done, I should say, but you're coming <laughs> to us from uh, Virginia, right? Yes. And uh, are you from there originally? I did not grow up here. I Grew up a little bit of here, there, and everywhere. I actually moved something like 15 times before I turned 18. So wow. um, not because my parents were in the military or anything, <laughs> yeah. but just because they liked to move. So um, huh. <laughs> spent a lot of time in the Midwest and then a little bit of time abroad in, sorry, a little bit of time abroad in Switzerland. Oh, wow. Yeah. So your parents just liked to move, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, the Switzerland move was a job di- driven move. And there were a oh. couple of other significant relocations that were job driven, either for my mom or my dad. But um, but then also within cities, they're just sort of like serial, serial new house people. They like they like to move. Yeah. <laughs> well, OK. Yeah. I mean, there's aspects of moving that it's like the ups and downs of it, like the packing and the carrying boxes and unpacking all that. Most people don't, in my experience, including me, don't seem to like that, but the actual, like, here's a new house and here's a new location and a new neighborhood. I guess uh, there's some, you know, positive fun aspects of that, depending on the personality. (laughs) That's right. And realistically, when you're moving every couple of years, the whole packing unpacking thing, you learn very quickly that you don't need as much stuff as you think. So yes. Great, great point. We talked about that in a recent podcast about just flushing things out. There's so much stuff we hold on to. And I've, I've been guilty of that. I've had family members and friends sometimes that fall into like almost a hoarder category yeah. of like, I've just got to hold on to stuff. And then and one of the things we talked about in this podcast was that, I don't know if you remember the movie up in the air where George Clooney was talking about, we don't need all this stuff. Yes. Uh, he did like this whole monologue in the movie about it. Yes. But, I digress. Go ahead. What were you going to say? No, I mean, I, I think you're, you hit the nail on the head. I have nothing to, to add. Okay. I think it's easy to fall into the trap of stuff and then feel like we should hold on to it um, just in case, or because it feels wasteful not to, or, I mean, there's a lot of reasons or stories that we tell ourselves about why, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing to have grown up moving so often. Yes. And I think we might touch back on this topic of holding on to stuff. Um, but so how did this whole moving you said 15 times before basically it sounds like before you graduated high school yes um how did this uh, i mean obviously you don't know necessarily what it's like to not because some kids born and grow up in the same house their entire childhood and doesn't sound like you did that obviously how do you think that affected your world and maybe did that affect bringing you to the things you're doing now you know, I haven't really considered how it might have affected bringing me to the things I'm doing now, but I think it did has sort of been instrumental to who I am as a person and how I, how I develop connections, right? I learned very quickly that, you know, home, home is a feeling and it's people and it's not a place. And I also learned that when you, I mean, so I think it was, I'm probably going to get the age wrong, but it might've been kindergarten age. And I was in daycare and preschool kind of all the way through both my parents worked. Mm -hmm. And um, it may have been kindergarten or first grade was the first time I went to the same place two years in a row. And I came home (laughs) on the first day and said to my mom, oh my gosh, it's all the same kids. Like I had no idea that not everybody was new every year. (laughs) Um, and so in that way, sort of going to a handful of different schools, living in different neighborhoods, being not so attached to place really created an adaptability and a, and it fueled what I think was already a natural part of my personality, but it fueled a curiosity. So when I'm thrown into a new situation, I get really excited to learn about a new place or learn about new people. Uh, And I think that has served me well professionally and personally, and probably is instrumental, frankly, to the coaching work that I do now, but I had never actually made that connection until this conversation. 
Oh, well, good. We're always uh, making new connections on this podcast. <laughs> good. I'm glad. I mean, that's that's a really interesting commentary because I think back to when I was a kid, not to make it about me, but like I still have friends, not tons, but from growing up because uh, I grew up in Albuquerque. Yep. We moved there when I was a baby and my, you know, my parents split up and my mom moved and lived other places and we went around, visited her and she, but we stayed with my dad, which was unique in the eighties. Uh, yes. And uh, but I still have friends. In fact, last weekend, a good friend of mine who I've known since sixth grade came out to, where I live in Las Vegas, by the way. And uh, nice. we went to a concert and did some things together and just reminisce on our time. Do you still have any friends like that from those uh, childhood years of moving around so much? So I was at the same high school. Um, I was at the same school from the middle of seventh grade all the way through 12th grade. So I did have some, I went to a private school, which meant that if we moved houses, that that environment didn't change. So I've got friends that I'm in touch with from high school, Mm -hmm. but from before that, not really with the exception of um, somebody that went to that preschool or kindergarten that I talked about where I went two years in a row and was so surprised actually ended up at the same high school as me and we're still in touch. So she's probably my oldest friend, but there's a long period in the middle there where we completely lost touch. Mm. Yeah. Well, and that happens. The funny thing now in this like internet Facebook age is all of a sudden you find someone you're like, oh, I recognize that face. They might look a little older or maybe they're bald or lost, you know, lot- yes, <laughs> gained or lost weight or whatever. It's like people change over the years, but it's like, oh, but I recognize those eyes <laughs> or. Yeah, it's totally true. And I think about that. So I've got a, my oldest, I have two kids. My oldest daughter, um, is a senior in high school this year. And we've been talking a lot about like how different it is in today's age to keep the connections and how much harder, um, you know, it was, I went to college in a time where the internet was sort of a new thing. Like my first two years of college, you had to go to the library to check your email, you know? Um, and so the whole keeping in touch thing took a little more effort. Yeah, for sure. That's uh, that's absolutely true. Um, interesting and interesting for our kid. I've got two boys myself. How many kids do you have? So I have two, I have a daughter and a son. My son is 13. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mine are yeah. a little younger, 12 and nine. So, okay. And they're in school as we speak, thankfully. Um, but in any event, um, so moving forward past all this, uh, moving stuff that you did and the other yes. things, not that that defines you, but that was a big portion of your childhood. Sounds like, yes. but so what brought you to where we are now doing this? And you wrote this amazing book and all these things. I mean, so like many things, it was a a journey. And I often tell people, I mean, there's a couple of places I could pick as, as the starting point, but um, Mm -hmm. kind of as an adult, my starting point was, you know, having done all of the things that I thought I should do. I went to the quote unquote good college and got the good enough grades and went to, um, went to a good law school, again, got good grades, got the job at the prestigious firm on the partnership track. And at that point I was married and my now 18 year old daughter was, um, a toddler under the Mm -hmm. age of two. And I found myself one evening, uh, sitting on the floor. It was probably a Tuesday evening. I'm sitting on the floor of the bathroom Mm -hmm. and I've got the cordless phone clipped to the back of my pants. And I've got, um, (laughs) you know, the headphones in and I've got a notebook on the closed toilet seat cover and I've got documents spread around me and I've got a toddler in the bathtub. And at the, at the same time I was trying to (laughs) bathe my toddler, I was also preparing an expert, um, for their upcoming either testimony or deposition. I was a litigator at the time and I had two thoughts kind of in rapid succession. The first was who says you can't do it all. Like here I am, I'm a present mom. I'm you know, home for bedtime, but I'm also doing really great work as a litigator and I'm, you know, on partnership track and I'm killing it. Yeah. And then the next thought was, and I'm exhausted and this is unsustainable. And probably most importantly, I'm not sure it's making me happy. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that was the beginning of a series of events that really led me to think about how do I want to, um, do this career and life thing. And what is actually the most important thing to me in this season? And how do I um, allocate my time, energy, and resources so that they're aligned with that? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting kind of moment. It's interesting in life, how you just have kind of these simple moments of reckoning that are like, Oh, it kind of shifts your view a little bit. And uh, so, and one of the things I noticed too, um, in fact, in your Amazon kind of, uh, 
synopsis of your book, it says, we're born to be happy somewhere along the way. Our lives get cluttered. Yes. Um, and, and then there's more, of course, I welcome people to go read all that and then pick up the book. But um, this thing about getting cluttered, it sounds like that's where you were specifically in that moment, maybe even more than clutter. I mean, you're sitting there literally cluttered on the floor in the bathroom <laughs> yeah. with the toddler in the tub. <laughs> yeah. And, and what happens I kind of want to look at both sides of this coin, if you don't mind me asking, like, sure, it seems like people, if we're very present in our lives and very intentional, we can avoid falling into the, maybe we can use the word traps of getting cluttered. Um, and maybe that's some of uh, how, you know, people, if they utilize your services and your uh, book and stuff that uh, they can use those tools and skills. Um, but for those who are already cluttered, as you were in that moment, uh, maybe we should start there. What what should people do? Uh, I know that's a very far reaching and general question, but what's what's the first thing someone should do when they come to this moment of reckoning? Like, oh, I am <laughs> I'm sitting on the bathroom floor, and and it's funny that you had both thoughts of I I could do it all, but also you were exhausted and you realized it was unsustainable. Yes. Long winded question. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think it's it's actually the perfect question, and. Um, I think the first, the, our first instinct as humans, right, is when we have a moment of reckoning like that. And sometimes there are simple moments like the one I described, and sometimes they're more dramatic. But our first instinct is to try to change our circumstances, right? Oh, I need a new job, or oh, I, you know, I have to hire additional help, or oh, you know, something outside of me has to change in order for me to solve this problem. Mm-hmm. And One of the most important steps, I think, actually, and it's the first step I take with almost all of my coaching clients, is actually not to change anything, but to really take stock of where you are today. And that feels opposite, especially for those of us who are type A achievers, drivers, you know, want action, want movement. You know, it feels uncomfortable sometimes to slow down and really take stock. But I Mm -hmm. actually think that's where you have to start because often people find that in order to solve that cluttered feeling, in order to solve that overwhelmed place, you don't actually need to significantly shift your circumstances. What you need to do is get really clear on who you are, what you need and how to achieve that where you're sitting today. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it's it's interesting I mean, as, as you're saying this, I'm thinking about your parents. Like, I don't know them as well as you do, of course, but it's like they kept changing circumstances. Maybe it wasn't because of these kinds of things, but, uh, but people do that, whether it's, Hey, I need a new car every two years or, or I need a new job or move or something more or less dramatic than some of those examples. But, um, to me, some of that comes, comes from a place of maybe running from something rather than just stopping and figuring out like you're pointing out uh and in your book uh where you are what matters to you and uh and finding those real needs and meeting them because i couldn't agree more uh as far as like our time management in particular like Mm -hmm. we have to be very intentional there to sit back and realize what matters because you could do anything with your time that's Uh, right i mean i'm in las vegas you know there's all (laughs) kinds of stuff i could be doing with my time and thankfully, I'm not choosing to do the things most would consider less uh, productive. <laughs> but yes, um, it's uh, so you have to realize, oh, OK, this matters. These like Stephen Covey talks a lot about the relationships yes. and the uh, what he calls the roles of influence, I think. Mm-hmm. And then uh, and then you realize, OK, what are the outcomes I want in these areas? And then you kind of backtrack of, OK, these are the steps to get there. What, what are your thoughts on that as far as, OK, once you realize what matters Instead of just letting life happen, and that's how we get cluttered, um, how how do we kind of reel that in and and come to a place of real uh, self awareness of what really matters, so that we can then accomplish that? Yeah, I mean, so I want to clarify two or bring up two important concepts that I think fit into this conversation. The okay. first is that our life is really a series of seasons, and so what matters to you today could change depending yeah. on how life evolves, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you said it, you've got two, two sons. I'm sure what mattered to you before you had sons is different than what matters to you now that they're a part of your family, right? Yep. Um, and so just acknowledging that sometimes things shift and recognizing that we often 
you know, when we are struggling with feeling cluttered or feeling misaligned or feeling stuck or overwhelmed, the first question to ask is, do I actually have an awareness of what season I'm in? And I'll give you an example. Um, When March 2020 hit, I watched a lot of people try to do the same thing in what was a totally different season. Yeah. And that created a lot of uh, of unhappiness, a lot of tension, a lot of clutter for a lot of people. And so number one is recognize the season you're in. And I like to think of it as like a playing field. So there's boundaries and limitations to each playing field and being able to play inside those boundaries is important, but you have to know that they're there first, right? Yeah. And then the second thing I want to clarify on the whole notion of what matters, I mean, I think first it's about broadly exploring what are the important things in my life, but ultimately in every season, there is one top priority, just one, not many, just one. So when, when you start to think about what matters to you, it is about defining your North star for that season. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. And I, when you say the thing about one top priority, one thing pops in my head, um, or the book essentialism, uh, and yep, that's had, one of my favorites. Yeah. Greg McHugh, we've had him on the podcast actually a couple of times and he's, um, but I remember in the book, he talks about the word priority centuries ago was just like a singular word. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now it's evolved to, we have priorities. Well, what does that yes. mean? It could be 12 or a billion or three. But it's plural, regardless as the more common usage is plural, it seems like. Yes. Um, so why, why one priority? Because, for example, um, you could say, well, I want my kids to have these and these outcomes and do this with academics and sports and, and with, you know, with my family. I want this and this outcome and personally and my career. Um, can those all be intertwined to become one specific or so, sort of general overarching priority? Maybe. I mean, I think it depends, but I think it's important. Like people will get into this game where they try to wordsmith it or play a game to like make everything fit. But when you do that, you're losing the the upside of having a single North star, which is when you know what is truly the most important thing to you in that season, you can make almost every decision more easily. You can decide how to allocate your time almost without thinking, you know, where you need to spend your money, where you need to spend your energy and you can have other things in the mix, right? When I say you have a North star, it's not then, and I ignore everything else. Right. 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 But the other stuff comes second or third or fourth. And so one thing I also encourage, so I like what what Greg says in essentialism about having a single priority, but the reality is most of us have a longer list of goals or achievements or things or outcomes that we want to be focused on. Right. But it is important yeah. to put them in order. Yeah. And because it, go ahead. I was just to say, because there will be times where you have to choose between them. Right. And how will you know which to choose unless you've done the work to really think through what the relative order is? Yeah. And, and that's an interesting, when you talk about, having done the work or doing the work uh, that we need to do that implies taking the time to actually do it. (laughs) Like in other words, if we're sitting around the toilet with the documents and stuff, not to keep going back to your uh, situation, but you know, proverbially, whatever that is in any of our lives, (laughs) um, it's like actually taking the initiative to, to, do that work to, to stop and start thinking about, okay, this is where I am. And these are the things that, that matter that I want and, and the priority system that, that I need to consequently put into place. Um, is there, is there a way people can more productively get to, or, or use that as part of their daily, weekly time of kind of self-assessment rather than just like going through the motions and getting cluttered, I guess it's just taking the time. I mean, it's that simple. (laughs) Well, I think it is that simple. I mean, I think there are a variety of systems you could use, but here's what I want to say. There are people who are listening to this right now who are thinking, oh yeah, yeah. I know my priorities, right? Like I've done this. I I can like just think this in my head and like, I don't need to spend a lot of time. Um, I just want to tell those people that you're wrong. And I know you're wrong because I've been you (laughs) and There is no substitute for getting the information out of your head into some tangible format so that you can actually see it in front of you. 
Now that could be, you know, a document on your computer that could be post-it notes on your wall. That could be paper in front of you. It could even be a, a voice recording or a conversation with somebody, but I think more, it's kind of really important to be able to see it tangibly in front of you, how you're spending your time, what is in your life. When I talk about, so I have an exercise in my book um, designed to help people do just this kind of take stock of where they are today. And when I do that with clients, we really create a map of what is taking their time, energy, and resources. And I say energy because oftentimes there are things in our lives that we're not spending a bunch of time on, but we are spending emotional energy worrying about. And it's important to get those out there too. And then we look, we talk about what's the North star, what's really important, what matters here, what feels good, what are you enjoying, what do you want to cut? Um, and we kind of go through this exercise of <laughs> rebuilding uh, how they want to spend their time, but you cannot do that in your head. You just can't. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so any notion that you have that you can sort of shortcut this or that you already know, I really would question and encourage you to sort of carve out the time and make it tangible. The other thing that sometimes happens when we do that is they say, you know, oh, my top priority, I'll just use a simple example. My top priority is my family. And then we go ahead and we look at what we've just laid out in front of us. And it's like, where's the family? <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because people are a lot of talk and it's like people say, talk the talk and walk the walk. Like you could say it's your family, but where's the family fit into the mix? It's, it, I, I like that your approach is very like, I don't want to use the expression in your face, but it's kind of tough love. We'll say like, no, this is, it is how it is. It's not trying to appease people so that they can stay in their comfort zone of what they've been doing. Cause if, if that worked, then they wouldn't be coming to chat with you anyway. <laughs> That's right. And, and I think, look, here's the deal. If you're one of those people who, and I've had clients, you know, who are sitting in front of me saying, but I want my family to be my top priority. Well, that's great. But then something about what we've just, you know, laid out in front of us needs to change. Right. Of course. And so I think a lot of times where our tension, where our unhappiness comes from is that we have a very deeply held priority, but we are not living aligned with it. And so we're unhappy and resentful that our time is being spent on things that aren't as valuable or don't matter to us as much. And so then we have to figure out how do we make it a priority? And then also more specifically, as you know, family is your top priority. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that actually mean? Yeah. And that's a, that's a, that's a really good probing general question for people to say, Oh yeah, I care about these people. Mm -hmm. I mean, most people have some feelings for it. That's why they would say my family's my priority, but how does that translate into action? It's like, I've always heard people say love is a verb, not a noun. It's, it's something that involves action. And, uh, and I love that you use the word aligned or alignment because we've talked, people who've listened to my podcast know that I've, someone taught me a long time ago, the word in Hebrew for joy means in part alignment mm -hmm. and, and so aligning ourselves and, and it's a constant ongoing. It's not like it's a one-time thing no. any more than exercise is you just, it's a constant process and maybe even struggle in some uh, capacity, but it's, it's something that we need to do to stay aligned. Just like, you know, my dad hurt his back the other day and I've hurt mine in the past. And maybe you've hurt yours. Some once in a while we got to get, get adjusted and get yes. our back aligned. <laughs> so, yes. um, how do our beliefs play into this? And you can touch back on any of these other topics too, but um, I know you talk a, a bit about beliefs and that's a very important thing because sometimes people don't even understand what their beliefs are, which is interesting. That's absolutely true. And, um, you know, so I, the way I think about happiness is like this. I think that the recipe for maximum happiness is super simple. It is do more of what matters and less of the rest. But simple, as we know, doesn't yeah. mean easy. <laughs> and I've sort of identified what I think are three gaps that get in our way. And we've talked about the first of those. I call it the authenticity gap, but it's the notion that we're not really clear on what it is that matters most to us and or we're not willing to claim that outwardly. So that's one piece. The next one that I talk about, and actually I think it's the one that often gets glossed over because we're an action-driven world and action-driven culture and, most, and a lot of us are just action-driven as people, is exactly the one you just brought up. I call it the emotional energy gap, but it's, do you have the supportive beliefs and feelings that will facilitate you living in alignment with your priority? 
or priorities, right? Mm -hmm. And there are, you hit the nail on the head, right? The first step is actually unpacking what it is that you believe. And then from that place, you can shift the beliefs that need shifting. You can reframe, you can do mindset work, you can remove limits, but you can't do that if you don't know what you believe. And frankly, so many of our beliefs around worth, around work, around productivity, around what matters, around the shoulds come from how we were raised, how we grew up, the society around us, the friends we have, even maybe further back come from our parents' experience of being raised, you know, and what that looked like. So There's a lot to unpack there. And as we start to do that, we work, often people find themselves saying, you know, surprised at what they believe, you know, they might say, oh, well, I believe. And then that comes out of their mouth and they're like, that's crazy. I don't actually believe that, but it is so sort of like a part of the fabric of who you are that you don't even realize it's what you believe. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sometimes that's like a scary place for people to go unless they start going there regularly to to understand and become more self-aware, which I would submit is one of the most crucial life skills, if you can call it that, to have is, is self-awareness for better or worse, yes. whether, and that that's all the things it's like, I'm good at this and I'm not good at this and I'm scared of this. And, and I have yes. this bad habit that I'm working on and this good and bad tendencies, you know, um, <laughs> go ahead. Well, and I was just going to say, it's scary because I mean, it's like on a very basic nervous system level, what you're asked being asked to do when you dive into your beliefs is go someplace you haven't gone and possibly change. And our nervous system at its most primitive is designed to keep us safe. And we've all heard of the fight or flight response, right? Yeah. And our nervous system keeps us safe by keeping us in the known. And I want to just make sure I make this point clearly. Your nervous system doesn't care what is on the other side of the unknown. It doesn't care if there's a pile of money, the most love in the world, the best possible outcome. What it cares about is that where you are today, it knows how to keep you alive and where you are going. It's not sure. (laughs) And so that often alone gets in the way of our change because it can feel really uncomfortable and potentially even unpleasant to go and into these places we haven't been before. But I think it's about distinguishing between the unpleasantness of change and a true sort of gut instinct not to. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because people, it's like the one thing that never changes is change itself. There's different versions of that kind of uh, quote throughout the years. And uh, and so if people can start to embrace that, which is hard, it's easier said than done. But it's the same thing like we mentioned exercise earlier. That's yeah. always easier said than done. I'm going to go do 5,000 pushups. Oh, that was easy to say, but actually doing it, <laughs> yes. unless I'm going to do it over the course of five years or something, then even then that's still a few pushups a day. But in any event, um, I, yeah, th- these are great points. One thing that I'm thinking of as we talk here um, is the concept of fear, because so many people, their belief system filters through a place of fear as well, even though we mm-hmm. don't, that's, that's one of those more difficult places to face. Like I'm scared. Of, and sometimes it's rooted in childhood, usually wounds of some sort. Um, you know, in my case, I come from kind of a broken home situation stuff. So there's fears and abandonment things and stuff that, that spring up as it pertains to me. And I think lots of people, but, and that's, that's sometimes it's hard for me to even say, but it's easier than it once was because I've become more self-aware and I've embraced who I am again, for better or worse, some of the good and some of the bad. Um, How how do people like some people are kind of running from their fears. It seems like, um, or that, you know, their issues or their wounds. Is there, is there some way people can get more in touch with that more readily as hard as that may be? (laughs) Well, I think, Look, I'm I'm not a therapist, so I want to be careful in the advice I give here, but sure. I do think that it is possible to recognize behavior patterns that come from our past and that are fear-based and to sort of approach it like an operating system upgrade so that you're not judging those behavior patterns. You don't even necessarily need to get to the root of them, but you can recognize that they're outdated and you can choose as your current adult self to make a new line of code, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I appreciate you kind of 
making sure that you're, you know, keeping things where they need to be in terms of what you do and what you bring to the table. Um, I, um, I was thinking too about, as I look at your book and stuff, you know, one of the things you talk about is, is how sometimes people have this list of shoulds and have tos. And you talk about focusing more on, on what actually matters, but it's like, I've heard our friend, Tony Robbins and others say things like our shoulds need to become musts in our lives. Like I should go spend more time with my son and help him with this or that or, or whatever. Um, is, is there something about that when you, when you just focus on what matters where shoulds become musts where, and have tos aren't necessarily always shoulds, right? Like have tos is like, I have to pay this, this bill, which yeah, you should so that whatever doesn't happen by not paying it, but it's not like that that's like at the core of what matters to you in your life. Yeah. I mean, so when I talk about shoulds, I use that term in the sense of things that, that the world tells us we should do. And I think the way that I would say it is that, I mean, if I was trying to put it in, in Tony Robbins words, (laughs) um, it would be that when you, when you are clear on what matters most to you, you get clear on what your must do's are and you can release anything that is not yours. So like yes, your shoulds, things that are belong to you absolutely should become must do's. But I want to be careful that, you know, like even the example you used of like, I should go spend this time with my son and help him with X, Y, and Z. Well, let's, I mean, if I, if you were my client or if, if a client said that, right, mm-hmm. I, I would push hard a little bit on that to say, well, what, what is it that makes you think you should do that? Mm-hmm. I think that's a great point because asking that and, and then asking more and more follow-up questions until you've gone as deep as, you know, reasonable, yes. but it's like, then people can start to carve out who they are and what really matters and why most importantly, because why is, because it's like, Hey, I should go spend time with my son. Why? Because he needs, he needs to learn how to do this or that, or, yes. or just have time with dad or with mom. Uh, but why, you know, and then yeah. why, why is, I mean, I know that's well, easy. <laughs> Go ahead. And, and you're hundred percent right. And the other piece I want to add is, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting and I work with a lot, a lot of my clients are working parents as uh-huh. many people in the world are right. Yep. And I was talking to a client um, recently and they said something along the lines of, I want to make sure that my family feels prioritized. Yeah. And that was an interesting statement. There was a lot to unpack there, but one of the things that came out of the conversation that I thought was really useful and interesting was when you want to make sure that somebody else feels prioritized, you need to actually understand what would make them feel that way. Yeah. So taking the example here of, you know, you said I should go help my son with blah, 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 blah. Well, is that important to your son would be one question. I don't, I'd like (laughs) the answer to, because that might help define the should, right? If the reason that you want to, you know, that you believe you should go do that is because you believe that that is a way that you will show your son he matters you better be sure that that is actually going to be the outcome. I couldn't agree more. And so it is having these conversations that we forget to have with the people in our lives about what it is that they actually need from us. Yeah. We make a lot of assumptions about how we can show up for other people in order to make them feel valued without ever checking in to see if that is actually what they need. Yeah, absolutely. Great point because I'm of the mind that if you're if you have an intimate relationship, marriage and whatnot, that that you should have a regular uh, sit down, whether it's, you know, every weekend on Sunday evening, we have a 30 minute chat is or some people might say, oh, I cringe at that idea. Well, make sure you're communicating to realize and even ask. I think most people appreciate being asked, hey, am I doing things right for you? I mean, what can I improve on? And then hopefully it's a two-way street where they say, oh, this and this, but I really do appreciate this. And also, what can I improve for you? And the same applies with the relationship with our kids and then extending out in business and other things too. Like, how can we do better for you as it pertains to whatever that relationship entails? And, and it, it, some of it boils down to love languages, doesn't it? Like, yes, it, it absolutely does boil down to love languages. And I think it gets missed 
where I see it get missed a lot is with, with kids. Cause we forget that they actually are capable of sharing that information with us, even from a pretty young age. Oh yeah. And it's been fun. Like we've reached a point with both of my kids where, you know, what I didn't tell you is after that bathtub moment, I entered a season in my life where I defined it as my mom first season. And that didn't mean that I stopped working outside the home, but what it did mean is that I went and found a job where I could, where I could, when I needed to be available to my family. Mm-hmm. And, um, as that job shifted and as I shifted into new work and, and had different career demands, one of the conversations I had with my kids was, look, I'm not going to show up at, or I'm not in a position where I can show up at every event. So I need you to tell me which events are the ones that matter to you. Cause I will drop everything to be at those. <laughs> yeah. That's but it's like, we, you know, we forget, we assume it's, <laughs> This is a theme that's been coming a lot up a lot recently for me. We assume that volume is what matters and it's actually about value. Yeah, that's absolutely true. That, that's a great, great point. And, and, and so communicating that, and I think we need to give our kids more credit, whether they're five mm-hmm. or 15 or 38, like wherever they are, kids actually are more in tune with how they feel than sometimes we I'll speak for myself, but I think we, as parents sometimes give them credit it's like, well, we have to be there to protect them and care for them, make sure they're fed and go to bed on time and all that. But um, also what they need along the way. And then to, to help develop our relationship with deep roots as they become adults where they want to come back at Thanksgiving or mm-hmm. whatever mm-hmm. is uh, I don't, I don't mean to be too far reaching to scare some, because some of us might have anxiety. Like, well, I don't want to think that far ahead of when they're 38 and, <laughs> yeah. and not wanting to come to Thanksgiving or do. <laughs> yes. But I like to think in a big picture, like this is what I do want. Like when I'm, when I'm in my 60s, 70s, I'm 41 now and my kids are grown up and maybe they have kids of their own. I do want them to be, to want to come. Maybe they'll, they'll split time with their spouse's family or whatever too. And that's okay. But I want them to want that. <laughs> and it's like yes. knowing that they want to be there with you shows you that, okay, we must've done something right in this relationship. Yes. Right? yes. And I think of it too, as an opportunity for us to help our kids build their skills around asking for what is important to them and discovering what matters to them and tuning into, you know, having a dialogue with somebody that they're in a relationship with as a parent about their wants and needs, because we don't learn that in life. And I've had to do a lot of work to, you know, on myself to get to a place where I'm comfortable with that. And I want to empower the children in my life, my kids, my nieces, my nephews, to be able to do it. Yeah. Well, and what a great point too, because at the end of the day, I think if we lined up all the parents in the world in a room, which would be a big room, but uh, I think most of us would agree that we would like our kids to be able to have their own healthy, happy relationships, even do hopefully better than us on all levels uh, as they become adults. And so these skills of being able to express, as you put it, the wants and needs are crucial to that. And it's not that they're self-centered. It's that it's a two-way street in these relationships that they become adults, intimate and otherwise. Like, And again, even in business, it's not necessarily you're coming and saying, hey, what are your love languages? But you, <laughs> you could kind of interpret and figure out sometimes the people in business, they come and hug you and whatever and do lunch. And you kind of realize, oh, okay, they have some of those kind of love languages and you communicate as such. But in more important things too, don't we want our kids and future adults and leaders, hopefully, to... Uh, be able to feel comfortable in their own skin enough to express these things. Um, and again, not from a self-serving place Mm-mm. only, but from a two-way street relationship place. And, and so we're p- preparing them by doing this, right? <laughs> right. And then I, I mean, yeah, and it is a two-way street, even as a parent and child, right? Yes. Because when they, when they start to feel that they can say to me, oh, this is really important for me, you know, for you to show up for me in this particular situation or context or in this way, then I, as a parent too, can go to them and say, Hey, this event is really important for me. And this is what I need from you in terms of your behavior or how you show up, you know? Um, And I would just add, you know, when you, when you switch it over to the sort of business or, or leadership context, if you're somebody who manages people, I would really encourage you to go and ask the people you manage, what do you need from me to feel valued and valuable? Yeah. What a great place to be as a leader to ask those kind of things. And what a great place to be as, as a, I don't know, for lack of a better word, a subordinate of a leader yes. to be 
to be asked that because then it's, again, it leaves the feeling that they're cared about, right? Yes. And, and you might need to ask it more than once because people might not have a ready answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, it could be, it could be asked as an open-ended thing. Like, yes. this is where I'm coming from and this is what I'd like to know. And I know I'm catching you kind of off the cuff here, but um, I would like this to be an ongoing conversation and maybe we reconvene in a couple of days or we'll do lunch, whatever it is and, yep. uh, and have this discussion. Same with our kids. Um, th- this is all really uh, valuable stuff. So if someone comes to you as a, as a coaching client, um, what, what does that process look like? I mean, we're, we're unpacking a lot of it already as far as the beliefs and, and the fears and figuring out a priority system. Um, usually if someone is looking for someone like you, I would imagine they're, they're struggling with something like, how do you figure that out first? I'm, I'm sure that's right at the forefront. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, and look, there's a reason that my, my, brand is untangle happiness, right? I, it all often comes to me as a big tangle, right? Yes. Um, a big knot to be unknotted. And one of my, I think my superpowers is figuring out which threads to pull. Um, mm-hmm. But the part we haven't talked about, and it's the third gap, you know, when I said the happiness recipe is simple, but an, I've noticed a couple gaps and we talked about authenticity and we talked about emotional energy, the belief part, but the last piece is like the physical gap, the, the actually living in a way that is aligned with your priorities. And there's a lot that goes into that too, in terms of how to manage your time, how to build habits. Cause sometimes I think we lose sight of the fact that what we're actually trying to shift is not a project or a task, but it's truly a habit, a a part of our identity that we need to change. Um, And so, you know, it, it is about walking people through all of those things, but in a way that is very specific to the challenge that they're facing. And my clients range Mm -hmm. from, you know, I've got a handful of sort of small company or small to medium sized company CEOs who, you know, are looking both to um, just kind of realign their lives so that they can be living in a way that is more satisfying to them, despite the success that they've had um, and do it in a way that creates good results, good culture and, and supports the team around them. And then I've got people who come to me thinking that they need to make a major career shift. Again, it's that, oh, I'm unhappy. My circumstance needs to change. And I'd say about half of them end up um, changing careers completely. And the other half end up um, finding a new job, but in the same sort of space. But we have to go through the process of figuring out who you are, reconnecting with yourself, defining what's important to you. And then from that calmer clearer platform, we can architect the happier future, the one that's going to feed your soul more. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great, great uh, place to be for any of us, especially when you talk about like these small business CEOs and stuff. I mean, there's so many, whether you're that or not in your life, um, there's so many demands. It's mm-hmm. like, there's, there's not enough hours in the day. And some of it is demands that we've decided are demands that maybe aren't quite the demands Correct. we once thought they were, <laughs> but, yep. but becoming clear is, is really uh, crucial to that process. Right. And some of, some of the things, like you talk about habits, um, yep. how do people, be, it's all part of self-awareness. Like we we all have habits, whether we're conscious and intentional with them or not. <laughs> Correct. And so the, there's a self-awareness piece to that. I just re- recently listened to the audio book of uh, Atomic Habits, which is yep. a very popular book, um, very well written too, and a lot of great little examples and stories and studies and all yes. kinds of things. Um, how do you help your clients and, and as far as your school of thought when it comes to habits? Because my, my I, I don't know if it's my... I've just subscribed to the pre-existing idea that habits, little things become big things. Yes. Whether how we eat, how we anything. So talk more about habits if you don't mind. <laughs> no, I'm happy to. Um, I would say a couple, I want to say a couple things. Please. Um, sort of back to the conversation we were just having mm-hmm. about the, you know, I feel like I should spend time with my son. The first thing when somebody, you know, talks about wanting to develop a new habit is getting really clear on where that desire is coming from. Because often people will say things and I'll use exercise as an example, because it's come up a couple of times in this conversation of like, I want to be better about exercising. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I I don't think anyone can argue that 
your physical wellness doesn't impact your entire life. It absolutely does. Yep. But if you have to choose between exercising and something that is fueling your top priority, I think, you know, which one I would tell you to choose. (laughs) Yeah. I love that place also because it's, there's a, there's an element of kind of measuring things out. Mm -hmm. Um, In other words, there's some people and I'm not coming down on anybody because people need to choose how to live their lives. But there's some people who seems to me from the outside that much of their life revolves around that, that just exercise only. And that's okay. If that's, if they find some version of happiness for themselves with that, then more power to them. But if it's like, Oh, I have to run a marathon every day. And, uh, and I know these are extreme kind of Mm -hmm. hokey examples, but it's the same with anything. It's like, there's a time and place for all of it. And like you said, if, if this exercise conflicts with this, or in some cases, can't we, I hate the term multitask because I think it's overused and misunderstood, but we can, we can multitask to an extent, like I want to spend time with my son. We can all go. We can play, go on a walk together. Yeah. Go or do that or play football throw the ball at the park or whatever. Or, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so it's like, I'm getting exercise and spending time with my son. Uh, I think Go ahead. you've hit the nail on the head there. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you because I just got excited because you're, <laughs> you're right on, you know what I mean? It, it, and it's, can you, you know, how can it fit into the bigger picture? And it goes back to sometimes like there's so much talk out there about healthy habits and how certain habits fuel success. You know, I had like, I had one of my CEO clients come to me recently and say, I need a better morning routine. Cause you know, I read the five minute morning and that's like, I, I think that will change everything. Yeah. And maybe it will. So I don't want to, you know, I'm never going to scoff at you right off the bat. But what was interesting is through the conversation, what came out was actually, I don't need a different morning routine. I just need to work on my wake up habit. (laughs) Yeah. Like, okay, that's so much easier than building a five step morning routine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can't speak to what works for people, but obviously the actions we take um, again, like we talked about earlier, everything's easier said than done. Everything actions speak louder than words as they yep. say too. Um, it's just those, those actions in the morning or otherwise should probably be in line and in tune with those, that set of priorities that we talked about. And here I keep using the word plural, even though it goes against what our friend Greg McCune, <laughs> but that's the modern world we're in. It's priorities. Yes. <laughs> And I would just say priorities in order are fine. You can be plural, but you have to have a ranking system. So, <laughs> yes. Well, that's when you talk about the word untangled or we use a word like clutter. I think so many of us can relate to that. It's like I heard someone once once upon a time talk about like they call it the law of entropy, where yes. things are either moving closer to or away from our objectives. In other words, they're always moving. They're yes. never, you're, ne- you're never in a stagnant place. And he used the example of his desk. Like my desk is going to, will become cluttered if I don't intentionally make an effort for it to not, because this will start to stack up here and here and then, it, it, or whatever. But that's just like a simple analogy for everything in life. The desk of this relationship with this person that matters in your life can become cluttered too. If we don't start to, as you said earlier, I think pull the right strings to yep. start to detangle. Um, so any other insights on the concept of detangling and uncluttering to, to kind of get things in more of a clear perspective that then puts you in a place of actionable uh, steps? I guess I would just want to say that, you know, I think that's a, the desk is a great micro analogy for the bigger um, phenomenon you described. Mm -hmm. And I just want to remind people you know, this goes back to the, sh- the shoulds. There's a lot of stuff out there that's like, well, if you just did it at the end of every day, or if you just did it every hour, or if you just did it every Sunday, you know, there's a million different ways you can do it. The important thing I think is to find the one that feels right for you. Mm-hmm. And I am a person with a cluttered desk, but I'm also a person who knows when the desk is too cluttered and it's time to take time to unclutter it. So it's also tuning into those instincts, like this clutter is now getting in the way of me getting to the outcomes I want. Therefore I need to address it. And yes, I could stop it before it gets there, 
but it's actually fine because often I find that the time I've spent on cluttering, I uncover something that was important. I take some, you know, it's a mental break I needed. There's all kinds of benefits that come from it. So I would just say, don't get too hung up on the, the how, find the how that works for you. Yeah, I could agree more. That's, that's great. And, and so it's almost like uh, the way I've started to look at time management myself is you start to realize what matters and then you need to make space for this throughout your week for kind of an easy chunk of time to look at. And maybe you're not spending time with your son certain days of the week, but there, there is ample time for other days to spend two or three hours here or there or whatever it is. And, and making sure that those things are on the table and that, you know, and the expectations are in place for all involved so that people are clear that even if like, Hey, I want to spend time with dad, but I know we're not going to do it today. We're going to do it on Thursday or Saturday yes. that that's coming. And so people can just rest easy knowing that, okay, life isn't so cluttered. We actually have plans in place to yes. make things happen. Like I always look at the word goals as like, I almost would rather use the word plans. Yes. Like let's, and I like goals too, <laughs> yes. you know, Zig Ziglar and others have talked a lot about, and I love Zig, um, but take those goals and turn them into plans. And, yes. and that could be time with your son, or that could be, I want to go be a billionaire or you know whatever, but that's still too vague. Anyway, I'm riffing here. Any, any no, other, I, go ahead. I have two, I have two things I want to say in response to what you just said. The first is Goals can be really complicated. And if goals work for you, by all means, goal yourself up, right? Like do it. <laughs> but this goes back to, you know, not worrying about the how and finding the how that works for you. For a lot of people, goals are something that becomes a weapon. They become a way that we measure our failure, not our success. Mm -hmm. And so I like to think about sort of like you said, plans. I like to think about mapping to a destination. Like ultimately I'd like to be here. And if I'm taking a step, no matter what its size every day towards that destination, I'm guaranteed to arrive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so for certain things that might feel more, um, like more likely to become kind of those weaponized goals, destination mapping can be a really big tool. The other thing I wanted to offer is something that I use and I recommend that my clients experiment with. I call it the daily three. Life is very full. Our to-do lists are very long. I like to think every day about three things that I'm going to do. And I like to make sure that at least one and hopefully all three are tied to my top priority. Yeah. And then if I do those things, everything else really is just bonus. Yeah, that's, that's all a great point. It's uh, it, again, it's all about intentional living. It's figuring out all this stuff and then staying in tune with it as you go forward, um, following our guts yeah. as we go a little bit too. like, oh, OK, I could declutter my desk, uh, but also this is the time I set aside to spend here or there with my son or whatever. Yes. Um, and so I'm going to do that. And this desk can wait. <laughs> yes. And, and if the desk isn't if the clutter on the desk isn't interfering with the action you need to take then the clutter is not the priority. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you've opened up so many great insights and some areas for all of us to think about, both for ourselves and the people that we care about. Um, do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to share with us? I, I mean, I could talk to you for hours, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, I know you've got places to go and people to talk to. Um, final thoughts. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, look, we've covered a lot of really important ground today. And I think you've hit on the important themes, right? Which is, you know, bringing intentionality to, to your life, which requires, and I'm going to say it several times, it requires slowing down and slowing down can feel uncomfortable, but the payoff of slowing down, the payoff of taking that little bit of extra time to become more intentional, to do the thought work, to really get the um, information out in front of you so that you can truly analyze it and think about how you want to be living, the payoff is exponential. So it's worth it to slow down. Yeah. Um, I think that would be the, the thought that I'd like to leave people with. Yeah. And what a great thought, especially for those of us in modern first world, especially in place like America, where it's always, it's, it's all so destination oriented. And I've been, I used to be, I don't know, I, I don't know if I was to say typical guy, but I was like real aggressive in traffic. It's because I'm trying to get somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
but I've started to realize I'm just going to enjoy this ride. And if something comes up that I didn't expect, I took a wrong turn. Oh, let's enjoy this wrong turn and see what, (laughs) see what happens. Yeah. Oh, well, I didn't know this was here or whatever. And I actually had experience like that with my friend when he was in town and it was just, we just had fun. It was like, Oh, I never saw this part (laughs) of town. Uh, But anyway, it's, it's just finding a way to live in joy and happiness and finding what that means for us. And I can't, you know, I love everything you shared with us. Um, and, and my last, my last thought is, uh, I've, <laughs> as odd as this is, I think about sculpting and I, I was actually even thinking about, I don't know if you've ever been to Disney world or something where they sculpt these bushes to look like Mickey mouse or something, Absolutely. Yep. or you could just go see this old sculpture of, uh, David or whatever, these famous sculptures of anything where somebody saw that in that and brought it out. And yep. so I think we need to just see what we want in ourselves and, and bring it out and not be scared to, and, uh, Becky, I can't thank you enough for sharing so many great uh, insights. Again, the book is The Happiness Recipe, A Powerful Guide to Living What Matters. Just came out this year as we're recording this, at least. You might be listening in five years, but I'm sure the principles will apply then too, even probably more so in the world that we live in. Yeah, right. And uh, thank you so much. And for our audience, thank you for spending time with us. We're flattered. And uh, until next time, empower yourself, empower the world around you. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Empower Humans. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review this podcast. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit EmpowerHumans.com. We'll catch you next time.